Chapter One. A driving rain battered Sarah's bedroom window. Thunder crashed and lightning illumined the trees bending precipitously outside the spacious townhome she shared with her husband, Kevin. The twin babies in her womb stirred. Their movements were still only tiny flutters and bubbles in her belly. But tonight she sensed they were as uneasy as she, shuddering alone in the house. Kevin was stuck in Manhattan. He had taken the train into the city to pick up a rare book for Fibonacci's esoteric bookstore where he worked. A sudden delay on the Long Island Railroad had stranded thousands of commuters. So he had stayed at his buddy Mark's downtown apartment. This was the first night in almost a year that Sarah and Kevin had been apart. Ever since taking the courageous step of merging their present consciousness with their past attainment as the first century Irish Druids, Alana and Alan, they had spent nearly every minute together. And when they were not physically in each other's company, they each had the clear awareness of the other as a tangible presence in their heart. The silver cord that linked them soul to soul was stronger than ever. The unity of love they shared was a miracle that still amazed them and that they cherished daily. In reality, they did not need phone calls or texts to communicate. Their spiritual teacher, F.M. Bellamari, who often appeared to them in his ascended master presence as Saint Germain, had encouraged them to practice the telepathy they had perfected as priest and priestess in the temple of the one light in Atlantis. The more they practiced, the more proficient they became. So that now when they wanted to connect, one of them simply beamed, I am here. And the other answered, and I. However, despite thunder booming and lightning flashing, they had opted for a phone call because Kevin was staying with a friend. Are you sure you're okay, hun? Kevin wanted to know. I don't like being away from you when it's storming. I really wanted to celebrate Bialtina with you tonight. I'll be fine, said Sarah with a lilt in her voice that lightened her husband's heart. And if I need you, I'll send you a signal. She stroked the silky black mini panther cat and adolescent wired haired wolfhound who were keeping her company. Sprite and Hero are here and I feel strong. You keep yourself safe and don't worry. We'll celebrate when you get home. The weather should be dry enough tomorrow to build a fire or two outside. Kevin was determined not to be anxious about the safety of his family. Worry was a type of inharmony that he and Sarah had vowed not to entertain. Whenever he felt flickers of concern or doubt trying to gain a foothold in his mind, he would replace those thoughts with powerful affirmations and thought forms. Tonight, he affirmed in his heart and soul that Sarah would carry her babies to term. Neither husband nor wife dared imagine the consequences of a third miscarriage. Besides, St. Germain had assured them that this pregnancy was under his protection. If an ascended master said they were safe, that was the truth. They must simply take precautions to ensure the family's health and safety. So far, all signs were positive. Thanks to a brilliant female obstetrician who recommended a small surgical procedure, Sarah had passed the pivotal four month mark of her pregnancy. She was resting as directed and was generally more at peace than Kevin had ever known her to be. And she was writing. The creative flow in new life growing in her womb seemed to stimulate inspiration. As the babies quickened, so did her imagination. Now that her novel had moved into the final stages of publication, she was deep into poetry. Kevin hoped she would sleep tonight, though he knew that when the muse tickled her imagination, she would lose all sense of time, often writing far into the night. Kevin's pal Mark had already gone to bed, 
So he stretched out on his buddy's none too comfortable sofa, said a prayer for his wife and unborn children and drifted off to sleep. Sarah couldn't relax, but the storm wasn't the problem. The front was moving through, lessening into a pleasant April shower, perfectly in time to welcome tomorrow's first day of May. Rather than disturbing her, this gentler rain created a soothing atmosphere that reminded her of the misty, soft days of Ireland. She eased out of bed, trying not to wake her pets who were curled up on Kevin's side of the bed. However, instantly sensing the possibility of a nighttime snack, Hero and Sprite woke up and eagerly accompanied Sarah to the kitchen. She made herself some chamomile tea to go with the scones she'd been craving all evening and found treats for the fur kids. Once they were all fed, she returned to her bedroom where inspiration often emerged. The babies were quiet in her womb. The dog and cat settled themselves on the bed and went peacefully back to sleep. Sarah propped herself up on a half dozen pillows, her journal on her lap. Allowing her imagination to glide into the rain steady sound, she suddenly felt it. That wonderful surge of inspiration she longed for, but could not force. Her muse was stirring. The spirit of era was calling. She ran her hand over the fine linens she had brought back from Ireland and cast her mind back to winter solstice of last year, the day her babies were conceived, the day she and Kevin had passed a crucial spiritual initiation. Miraculously, they had found the remains of the ancient oak grove where their druid selves, Alana and Alon, had spent countless hours studying with their friend and mentor, Master Druid Oingus. The grove had also been where Alon guided Alana into a series of remarkable past life reviews. Last December, after three long days of ritual prayers, chants, and visualizations in the grove, Sarah and Kevin had powerfully reconnected with the soul fragments of their druid selves only to narrowly survive a harrowing knife attack by their ancient enemy, Bran Bon. The druid had appeared outside the grove, determined to kill Kevin, exactly as he had murdered Alon nearly 2,000 years earlier. Sarah shuddered as she recalled the frightening night when she had driven her injured husband to a remote clinic. How she was able to navigate their rental car on the left side of a dark, two-lane road, she still wondered, except that her animal spirit guide, a panther named Sprid, had led her. When they arrived at the clinic, every detail seemed to be already in place to assure Kevin's healing. Two days later, thanks to helpers seen and unseen, they had arrived at the Neolithic structure of Newgrange in time to experience the winter solstice sun in its annual procession down an ancient stone corridor on its way to illumine the central altar deep in the earth, nature's primordial guarantee of fertility for the following spring. They had been the first visitors to enter the structure allowing them to stand next to the central altar. When the dawn's powerful light rays reached the altar, Sarah had felt herself filled with radiance as if she were Mother Earth. Even now, she remembered the sensation. Although they had been surrounded by strangers, she and Kevin had immediately shared an awareness that this was the night they could try again for a family. Sarah rubbed her hand gently over her belly where her twins were resting quietly and remembered those days of new life. She had known almost immediately that she was pregnant. In her previous pregnancies, she had felt the same swirling, spiraling energy in her womb and breasts, though never so powerfully as this. Last week, she had drawn a picture of what she was experiencing. The image was exactly the spiral image 
that she and Kevin had observed on the huge lozenge shaped stones that guard the entrance to Newgrange. To Sarah's mind, those spirals, which had been carved 5,000 years ago, were proof that life continues a borning in the womb of the earth and her people. The seed is planted in the dark of winter so it can blossom in the light of spring. Her entire body resonated with that potential. She closed her eyes, going deep into her meditation on the spirals. Was it possible that her other pregnancies could not hold until the light dawned on who she and Kevin had been in past lives so they could claim who and what they were meant to be in this life? Perhaps the babies could not grow to full term until their parents were spiritually prepared for these particular souls who were destined to be part of their family. Saint Germain had said these babies were spiritually advanced friends of old. Sarah felt that to be true. As her meditation intensified, she was now acutely aware of the spiraling energy building within her, becoming more dynamic as if the energy were also outside of her, swirling around her body. She felt herself being enveloped in a sensation of such intense love that she knew was more than affection for her unborn children. Here was the passion of souls united in a work that must be accomplished by twin flames on behalf of other soul pairs, exactly as Saint Germain had promised. Was she carrying twin flames? She would have to ask the master, though she felt the truth of it in her being. He had explained that she and Kevin would be instruments of soul liberation for many other pairs of souls who were being primed to discover the true self each one must become in this age. Basking in the vibration of this commission, Sarah snuggled deeper under the covers and let her imagination flow freely. She was surprised that her thoughts turned to Glenna, the young woman she had begun writing about nearly eight years earlier. While Sarah was still working as a marketing writer for powerful New York politician, A.B. Ryan, her coworker, Debbie, had introduced her to an actress friend named Glenna Morrissey. The two young women had felt an immediate connection. Being of Irish descent, Glenna felt a keen fondness for the Emerald Isle, though she'd never had the opportunity to visit. Although their paths had crossed twice more, they had never really become close. However, being introduced to Glenna had sparked Sarah's imagination, and she had written a brief sketch about her new acquaintance. She had shared this scenario with Kevin when they first met years ago, but for some reason, a full story had never gelled. Now she found herself wondering about Glenna. What was she doing these days? Was she still acting or had life sent her in a different direction? Had she ever visited Ireland? The voice of Sarah's inner wisdom answered, pay attention. There is alchemy afoot on behalf of twin flames. Your next commission from the Ascended Master Saint Germain begins tonight. Enfolded in the aura of inspiration, Sarah was certain that she and Glenna had known each other in ancient Ireland, though she wasn't sure of their relationship. Perhaps they had both known Debbie, who had been embodied as Alana's aunt the seer and healer, Darva. Should I pursue the connection with Glenna? Sarah wondered aloud to her soundly snoozing pets. She and Kevin had agreed that any information they uncovered in dreams or past life reviews should not be shared with others unless those revelations emerge naturally in conversation. Unless they were asked, it was not for them to disclose what they knew about the embodiments of their friends or acquaintances. That was one of the purposes of the Friends of Ancient Wisdom, 
the group of spiritual initiates who met at Fibonacci's bookstore and coffee shop for conversation and mutual support on the path of soul liberation that each of them was pursuing under the direction of Saint Germain. Many of the friends remembered their past lives and former associations, but no one prompted another with personal recollections unless they agreed to explore those memories together. Regardless of that agreement, Sarah felt a strong urging from her inner wisdom. Somehow, she must get in touch with Glenna. When Kevin returned home tomorrow, they would decide how to proceed together. Unseen helpers from the Great White Brotherhood, white for the etheric radiance that surrounded the forms of these great masters of light who were female as well as male, agreed and set the stage for that connection. Although the storm had picked up again, the sound Sarah heard as she drifted off to sleep was no longer rain drumming on her roof. Instead, she was hearing the thunderous applause of a standing ovation. For tonight was the closing performance of a smash Broadway musical revival where Glenna Morrissey was taking another curtain call with the cast that had been her theater family for the past 12 months. <laughs> 